welcome everyone. My name is Robert Strand. I have the privilege of being the executive director of the Berkeley Haas Center for Responsible Business. On behalf of Dean Lyons and the Human Rights and Business Initiative based at the Center for Responsible Business, and in partnership today with the Human Rights Center, we're excited to have you here today. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dean Lyons and our guests. I welcome all of you today to this wonderful event that is co-hosted by our Dean's Speaker Series at the Haas School, also the Center for Responsible Business in partnership with our wonderful Human Rights Center at the Law School. Please uh, let me start by saying thank you to, to Brad Smith and the whole team at Microsoft for their partnership with us uh, in our Berkeley Haas Human Rights and Business Initiative. Today we're excited to explore how technology can help us advance together human rights, and more specifically, how it can support the protection of freedom of expression. What is the state of freedom of expression in the world today? According to a 2014 Amnesty International report, approximately 75% of national governments still restrict freedom of expression to some degree. Furthermore, the 2017 World Press Freedom Index pointed to a surge in the number of countries where media freedom is at risk, especially in countries with dictatorships and totalitarian regimes, but also in areas where war and chaos prevail. You might be tempted to think that this is a them, not us situation, but how do you think the U.S. ranks on this index? It ranks number 43, happens to be between Burkina Faso and Comoros, and down by two positions since 2016. Recent public statements such as the ones that label the press as counter to America's interests will probably further weaken our position in these types of rankings. I used the word our. I realize the U.S. doesn't describe everybody in the room as our. Although the U.S. ranks lower than one might expect, Americans are generally more supportive of free speech than any other country. 71% of Americans believe that people should be allowed to say what they want, citing the U.S.'s First Amendment. But being supportive of freedom of expression does not translate into support for hate speech. Recent events in Charlottesville have brought hate speech to the forefront of our nation's conscience and have reignited calls for censorship. Yet the right balance, of course, can be hard to find. For key actors such as governments, businesses, universities, as freedom of expression and censorship are generally opposing forces. At UC Berkeley, the birthplace of the free speech movement, we believe that the public expression of divergent points of view really is fundamental, both to democracy and also to our mission as a university. At the same time, we continue to stand up and support our, our university's principles of community, which firmly state that discrimination and hate will not be tolerated here. The confluence of our history and values makes us a natural epicenter here at Berkeley for continued discussions on this topic. And at Haas, our human rights and business initiative aims to increase dialogue with business on their role in addressing human rights challenges, including freedom of expression. That brings us to today's discussion. Companies are increasingly being called upon to take a position, to have a point of view on freedom of expression, especially tech companies, of course. New technologies have created uh, new opportunities and platforms for society to express themselves. But these new technologies come with new challenges, including the proliferation of hate speech on social media. Microsoft and the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights recognize these challenges. They are committed to advancing freedom of expression. We are honored to have them with us here today to share their viewpoints and their vision on the roles that business and technology can play in promoting and enhancing human rights. It is now my privilege to introduce our guest speakers and our moderator. Zaid Rod Al Hussein is the sixth High Commissioner to lead the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the first Asian, Muslim, and Arab to do so. A veteran multilateral diplomat, the High Commissioner was previously Jordan's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, as well as Jordan's ambassador to the United States. Brad Smith, Microsoft's president and chief legal officer, leads a team of more than 1,300 professionals working in some 55 countries. Brad is also a vocal human rights advocate most recently speaking out against the government's decision to rescind DACA. 
Last, let me introduce my colleague, Alexa Koenig, our moderator. Alexa is the executive director of our Human Rights Center at UC Berkeley's School of Law and teaches classes on human rights, international criminal law. She directs the Human Rights Investigations Lab, which trains and works with students to use open source methods to support human rights and advocacy and accountability. Please join me in welcoming these terrific guests today. Thank you, Rich, and thank you all so much for being here today for this conversation. Um, I don't think any of us could have known when this event was first being put together just how incredibly salient this topic would be this week on the Berkeley campus. And so it's incredibly exciting to have both of you here today to help us think about what's happening at Berkeley, what's happening, happening across this country, and what's happening across the globe. So my first question, I'm hoping you can kind of help set the scene for what is happening around the world and what you're seeing with so many issues going on in the human rights space right now. Why do we need to be talking about freedom of expression and why is this conversation so important? Hmm. Um, Hi, Commissioner, if we could start with you. All right, uh, thank you, Alexa. Uh, Dean, I mean, Rich sort of opened up uh, the point that I would have raised which is the space for dissent is rapidly shrinking. Authoritarianism is on the rise, censorship is on the rise, and as our lives are so connected to the World Wide Web now, uh, where there isn't a daily experience which somehow doesn't uh, embrace this technology and the changing technologies, uh, the traditional forms of censorship uh, have now been exacerbated when two-thirds of the users are in uh, countries where uh, repression is rife, authoritarianism is strong. It's no wonder that Freedom House, uh, for, sixth, for the sixth year in a row, has noted that uh, internet freedoms have been on the decline. Um, and uh, so we must essentially double down from uh, our side as well, whether you're a human rights defender or a major corporation. Uh, this now has become a bare-knuckled fight for rights. Uh, and as I was speaking to a, a group earlier today, I said it's essentially we have to become human rights brawlers. Uh, yes, scholarship is important, uh, erudite arguments are important, but uh, to counter the effects uh, that we see happening, the pernicious effects where freedom of speech are concerned, we must engage with more on the exercise of uh, freedom of speech. Certainly, there are deleterious sort of effects coming from uh, the incitement uh, part, of course, the incitement to hatred and violence. And, and the balance spoken that Rich spoke of requires some very fine-tuned thinking. And uh, we need to, as uh, the uh, Haas, who, uh, ha uh, sorry, Haas uh, Business uh, School is dedicated, we need to uh, continue to deepen the dialogue between uh, major corporations and the human rights community on ensuring that uh, as corporations are expected to engage in the regulatory framework, that they uh, are kept uh, very much uh, in line with human rights, international human rights standards. And, and this is where we think we can do good work to push back on what we see happening in countries where they close down the internet for a week, as Egypt did in 2011, or as we saw in Turkey and Uganda, where the internet was closed down for a period just before elections, or Togo closed down the internet for a period when they felt that young people were activating against the, the government. Those sorts of phenomena we must, we must, uh, we must um, fight against. And I think together, uh, acting together, the major corporations with the human rights community, we can advance this uh, and uh, roll these pressures back. Thank you. And Brad? Well, first, it's wonderful to be here with you and with the High Commissioner and, and with all of you at you know, such an important location at what I think is such an important moment in time. Uh, if you think about the history of free expression, uh, I think uh, that Charles Dickens' words speak so powerfully to us today. This is, I think, quite literally the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. Um, consider the best of times aspect first. 
Uh, you know, free expression has many definitions, but I think one of the best is in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, where Article 19 defines it basically as the right to seek, to receive, and impart information and ideas of all types. Well, think about the ability to seek information. Has there ever been an invention for the world more powerful than the search engine? We can look at our phone, we can look at our laptop, we can type in a word, and we can seek information from around the world. To receive it, all we have to do is click on a link. One click of a finger brings us to information anywhere in the world. And then think about what it means to impart information, basically to publish it. How many of you have either a Snapchat or an Instagram account? You all have an ability to share information, to publish, to impart information with the world that was not even imaginable just two or three decades ago. So when you think about those dimensions, you might think that we are so fortunate that we live in a golden age of free expression, and indeed, in some ways, we do. But I completely agree with the High Commissioner that we also live in a dark time in many ways as well really because of two different dimensions. This first problem that we have to think every day about is how some people, unfortunately, are using their freedom of expression to create tremendous problems for humanity. If you think about a problem like child pornography or child exploitation, the internet has unfortunately done more to spread that problem and to victimize more children than any technology in the history of the world. If you think about hate speech, if you think about how individuals can go use the ability to seek information to find out how to build a bomb and engage in acts of terrorism, you suddenly appreciate that this golden age has this dark undercurrent, and then we understand why governments of all types understandably worry about it. But then there's the third dimension, and it's the part that in, on many days worries me the most. It's the part that the High Commissioner, I think, talked about quite explicitly. Uh, I think there's two enemies of healthy free expression. The first is propaganda, and the second is censorship. And the world has seen many forms of propaganda over time, but in our moment in time, I think a question for this very week is whether the world has ever seen a more sophisticated form of propaganda than what was employed on Facebook in the 2016 presidential election. We'll all learn more and have an opportunity to answer that question more decisively, and regardless of the answer, I think there is one thing we nonetheless will know with certainty, that there will be governments in the world in 2020 that will be even more sophisticated in how they seek to use propaganda in this technological age. And the censorship keeps growing in more sophisticated ways as well. The same machine learning and development of algorithms that can be used to do so many good things can also be used to identify more quickly the political movements that governments may want to repress and the tools that they may want to deploy or force technology companies to deploy, to suppress the kinds of expression that most people in virtually all, but not all, parts of the world, most days would agree, are protected by Article 19. So we live in an amazing time, and of course if we're talking about the role of business, because we are talking about technology that is created by business, this is a topic that is inextricably intertwined with business itself. And on the one hand, it's a wonderful time to get up in the morning and go work at a tech company. I think there's few times in history where one could go to work at a business and have a greater opportunity to do good. But there have been few times when the opportunities have also been clouded by issues that are so global and are so challenging. And so as big as our opportunity to do good may be, I think our responsibility to exercise that power is in fact higher still. And it's why these kinds of conversations in the open 
and with people who have such a distinguished record of protecting human rights like the High Commissioner are so valuable. Thank you. So picking up on this idea of businesses and what businesses specifically can do, um, Tim Cook of Apple recently stated, and I'm going to read this so I don't misquote him, the reality is that government for a long period of time has for whatever set of reasons become less functional and isn't working at the speed that it once was. And so it does fall, I think, not just on business, but on all other areas of society to step up. So in light of that quote, I have two, commission, or two questions, one for each of you. And starting with Brad, I was wondering if you could speak with us a little bit about what should be the role of business in protecting freedom of expression. And then a little bit more specifically, what is the role of Microsoft in that bigger effort? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I think Tim put it well. I mean, I think there's a need for all of us uh, to step up. Uh, I think it would be a mistake to expect a single part of society, the business community, or any other to solve this problem. And I think it would be almost asking too much in a way that would give you know, one group too much influence or power. Uh, but we clearly have an important role to play. I think our role always needs to be twofold. First, we need to make sure our own house is in order. We need to make sure that we're not harming the very causes that we should be protecting or advancing. And so I, I, I think it always has to start with us. You know, what are we doing, for example, ourselves in terms of protecting people's privacy? Uh, we have a lot of data, a lot of very important personal information about people. Are we doing what we should be to safeguard it? Uh, as we're running social media platforms, Microsoft uh, owns LinkedIn. Uh, as we're deploying a search engine? Uh, are we thinking these things through? As we build data centers around the world, as we do, we have a human rights review before we will put the information that belongs to citizens in a data center in a country. We better do a very thoughtful job of considering whether we can protect that from these kinds of abuses. So I think it starts with us, uh, and you know, we've long been proponents of accepting this responsibility. Uh, we were the first tech company to sign on to the UN Global Compact. Uh, I think people who work at our company are proud of the work we do. And yet I also think it's extraordinarily important to remain humble. The moment you become too proud is likely to be the moment you stop thinking as broadly as you should. And that's when you start making mistakes. So you know, every day just retain that focus. And then there's the second area, which is how can we use technology as a new tool to better protect human rights? It is a tool that can do great good. So whether it's the work that we've had the opportunity to undertake uh, with OHCHR to use data mm -hmm. to better identify abuses, to better uh, document abuses, to help the UN and other organizations protect people from abuses, whether it's other opportunities to use this technology to capture these abuses. I mean, think about how the debate in this country on the role of race and criminal justice changed. The moment it ceased to be a debate among competing anecdotes of based on people's memories about what happened, and instead it came down to a video taken from a smartphone that we were all able to watch together. That is just one slice of the kind of opportunity that we have. And I think you know, doubling down on those opportunities is another part of the types of things that we and many other companies are focused on doing. Thank you. So for the High Commissioner, I think a natural extension of that question that I asked Brad is then what would be the role of intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations and like your office um, in terms of protecting freedom of expression and the threats that have been raised earlier? If uh, we take Tim Cook's uh, statement to be true, and governments are generally failing to provide their people with the sort of services that they ought to expect, uh, failing to honor their obligations in respect of human rights, uh, then you can understand that expecting them to come to agreement on some of the major questions uh, that confront the planet is going to be challenging, uh, of course, uh, 
in a manner that's staggering. Uh, it was uh, quite interesting, of course, listening to President Trump speak at the UN last week because he was not saying that all of us need to work together to solve the global problems. He was saying, more or less, uh, all of you countries, go it alone. Um, we, we, you be proud of who you are and uh, embrace the sort of uh, ethno-nationalism, if you will, and uh, invoke sovereignty and go it alone. And uh, for us who work in the intergovernmental space, this clearly isn't the recipe. Uh, I think the world suffered enough from those sorts of injunctions. Um, we can only solve these problems if, as Brad said, it's a combined effort, all in, all hands on deck, with humility, recognizing that, it, it, that our generation are leaving to you uh, a, an impossible situation unless toward the latter part, half of our lives we can uh, leave something that is more manageable for you in the intergovernmental space. Uh, clearly what we need is uh, leadership. Uh, we need uh, corporations and uh, multinational companies, uh, tech companies that have uh, such a huge stake in uh, where the planet uh, basically, in what direction the planet moves in, uh, to combine, to create the sorts of uh, understandings we need. For instance, I don't think when Facebook uh, has these teams or uh, uh, they, who would sort of moderate content, basically, or basically our, their job is to sift through, the, uh, through whatever content's on Facebook mm -hmm. and then take decisions on moderation. Uh, I don't know to what extent they have expertise in Articles 19 and 20 of uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. I don't know if they have exposure to this Rabat formula that we have for the, making a determination when uh, freedom of expression has exited, or we've exited freedom of expression, and we're certainly in the incitement uh, uh, part of the uh, International Covenant. Uh, what we need is transparency. We need to know what the criteria are, are and we need to sort of dovetail with um, companies such that if they are going to be the police and judge, of these issues. They're a police and judge that are abiding by international standards. And, and that's the point we'd like to reinforce. Thank you. So speaking of dovetailing with companies, I know there was this announcement recently made that many of you may already know about between Microsoft and the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights um, around a five-year partnership. Mm -hmm. Would you mind both explaining to us a little bit about how that came about and what you're hoping to accomplish yeah. with this partnership? Brad. <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> no, I, I am personally very enthusiastic uh, about the opportunity that we have to work together. Uh, you know, the OHCHR started to assess broadly you know, its potential technology uh, needs three or four years ago, and a number of companies uh, you know, provided suggestions. And you know, from my perspective, there's three things that I hope we can accomplish over the next th five years and beyond because I think all of this is about the rest of our lives and not just you know, a, a period of time. First, uh, I, I really do hope that we can find new ways to use technology as a more powerful tool to protect human rights. Uh, I, you know, I see in so many circumstances where it can change the game. And in many ways, in some places it already has, but it's done so without a determined strategy um, that has been well resourced in the human rights community and certainly not uh, in the way that the uh, you know, office and the high commissioner now have the opportunity to pursue. Uh, so one of the initial projects is really around how to uh, equip the United Nations with the kind of big data resources and, and knowledge and techniques um, that companies and uh, increasingly NGOs are, are pursuing. I, I think there's a lot of good that can come out of that, and I just think there's so many opportunities to keep innovating in that space. Second, uh, there's such an important need for us to have a broad public global discussion about how this technological age in which we live is really changing the kinds of human rights topics themselves. Um, you know, it is the, the new public square, if you will. Um, you know, what does it mean to have a community? What does it mean to give people the, the ability to speak? You know, you know, what does it mean to worry about the problems that come out of hate speech and the like? 
Uh, and that is a conversation that needs to be in public in a way that brings everybody together. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we all need to learn from each other, and we need to learn from each other with uh, recognition that this is a global topic. It's not confined to any single country. And we need to balance these values that are universal with also a respect for other cultures uh, around the world. And then, frankly, the third thing that got me excited about this is, look, I just think the human rights causes of the world need more money. Yeah. It's sort of as simple as that. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the, the High Commissioner on some topics can probably say some things that I cannot, and on other topics maybe I can say some things that he cannot. Um, it's a hard job. It's a hard job because governments want the High Commissioner for Human Rights to be very vocal, especially when he's poking other governments. Mm -hmm. And they're not nearly as enthusiastic when the High Commissioner is poking them. And, you know, unfortunately, it's a tried and, <laughs> and, 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 it's a tried and true practice uh, of governments since the United Nations was founded for them to use the threat of cutting off money as a way to influence what the United Nations institutions do. Uh, and I think that the High Commissioner can accomplish more, just as I believe that NGOs can accomplish more if they have more financial resources. And one of the best ways to do that is to diversify mm -hmm. a financial base. And one needs to be very thoughtful about it. One doesn't want to open up you know, a, a window that leads to other problems or abuses or a loss of confidence. Um, but I happen to be uh, one, and we happen to be a company uh, that believes that a better funded, more diversifiably fi financed uh, UN human rights arm is going to be an institution that will do good for the world and protect people not just their ability to speak, but in some cases, their ability to stay alive. So it sounds like it's both aspirational, but also has a very strong, pragmatic base to think Absolutely. about how we move everything forward. Yeah. Hi, Commissioner, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Brad. Uh, I mean, technology for us uh, and the advances in technology helps us do our work in a way which hitherto would have been impossible. Last week, I was speaking to uh, a very prominent human rights defender in Venezuela. And uh, a few years ago, I couldn't have done that. Uh, we use technology to make an assessment uh, in what's happening in Rakhine State, northern Rakhine, regarding what we believe to be ethnic cleansing uh, of the Rohingya population into Cox Bazar. And we use whatever technologies are available. And as Brad said, and, uh, our relationship with Microsoft began a few years ago in terms of analysis of uh, video evidence. The boards of inquiries, the investigations we put together, some now 43, I think, in total, uh, much of it receives video uh, evidence, and that has to be assessed and analyzed. And we began our relationship like that. And then it, is, it has expanded. So we now have this uh, dashboard, rights view, that we're putting together with uh, Microsoft which will give us a sort of instantaneous picture of the rights situation in any given country across all the different meters. And it's hugely important for us in terms of the advocacy, the poking that uh, we have to do, hard poking sometimes. Mm -hmm. Someone once said, to, said of us that we are the international nags uh, <laughs> that don't go away because we just keep nagging on, on countries to do, to do the right thing. We also, though, we uh, paired up uh, uh, my office and Microsoft um, on the uh, LGBTI mm -hmm. agenda in business. And we uh, applauded uh, Microsoft together with some other corporations, Accenture and so forth. When in Davos, we began to have this discussion. Uh, you have to, you know, now Brad and I will be talking later on today at the World Economic Forum event. But the World Economic Forum is very conservative when it comes to human rights. In fact, in most business literature, you barely, you rarely ever see human rights. You see, you talk about all-inclusive economies, they talk about gender empowerment, they talk about persons with disability rights. But human rights, it just is seen as too toxic. And where I think it's so important 
is that the great work that we've done on this agenda item on LGBTI, and yesterday uh, or two days ago I was in New York at the Microsoft headquarters in New York where we launched uh, a, a series of standards for how uh, corporations need to approach LGBTI rights plus other rights of their employees and beyond. Um, the importance for us is to move it more into the mainstream, both in financial literature, but move it to the heart of the World Economic Forum discussion. Because if I may say so, Brad, you know, we are champions of this, but we're still on the margins of it, mm -hmm. and we're trying to move it right into the middle. So that's another example of what Brad was saying, mm -hmm. of having corporations take on this, realizing it won't damage their business model to articulate what are essentially, in many respects, the inalienable rights of each one of us. And if that does damage, well, then the other side has to bear responsibility for explaining to its people why it's taking a rather different view of rights. Uh, the corporations involved can always be on the right side. Thank you. So I have one last question for each of you before we open it up to the audience. Um, Brad, you have very visibly, over the last several weeks and, and months, called for a digital Geneva Convention. Would you mind speaking a little bit about why you think that next step is so important and what you're hoping that will encompass? Absolutely. Thank you. I, I, there's two things that I think are of just fundamental importance for all of us in the world in which we live today. The first is to have a broader public recognition of what I believe is just a tremendous rise in threats that are coming from nation states and the use of cyber attacks. And these attacks take many different forms. Um, you, we saw it this year in the WannaCry attack where the North Korean government, by all indications, used cyber weapons that were stolen from the National Security Agency, the NSA in the United States. And these were used in a way that infected, basically stopped working, something like 200,000 computers in 150 countries, including hospitals in the United Kingdom in the middle of critical work. Uh, we saw it the next month in the Petya attack, which I think was an attack on the Ukrainian economy by another nation state. Um, you know, we see it in the hacking of political leaders, whether it was in the United States in 2016 or the myriad of attempts that we witnessed as a company in France in 2017. I think this is a threat to our democratic institutions. It is a threat to the infrastructure of our lives. And if you stop a hospital from working in the middle of a sur surgical proceeding, it is literally a threat to people's physical lives as well. It is a new era of invisible weapons, and we need to take it seriously. We ultimately need to take a number of new steps to combat this. Certainly, we as a company are taking steps of all types, including legal action, where we've been able to use the law here in the United States to disrupt nation-state attacks and then work with the customers that are, are you know, being sabotaged in this way. But governments need to act. I think there are norms in place today there is customary international law emerging. We need to work together to strengthen that. We need to rally public opinion around the world. And then ultimately, we need to learn from history. It took World War II and its incredible horrors to open the world's eyes to what could happen to civilians in an armed conflict. But out of that knowledge came in 1949 a diplomatic conference that produced the Fourth Geneva Convention. It is the convention that imposes not just a moral obligation, but a legal duty on governments to protect civilians even in times of war. As we now see governments attacking civilians in times of peace, what we've said is we need a new Geneva Convention. We need a digital Geneva Convention that will compel governments to do what they should do and not attack civilians whether they're running for office or running a media outlet or running the electrical grid or running the hospital or just you running your life. And we shouldn't stop until we do what the people of the last century did and win the kind of protection that our generation deserves. Thank you. 
Um, hi, Commissioner. My last question for you. You're here on the Berkeley campus, which has been the epicenter of a conversation around free speech for the last several months. I was wondering if you could say a few words about how you would reconcile this tension between freedom of expression, particularly when it bumps up against threats to personal values and rights, such as issues of gender, um, issues of race, et cetera, and what you think the role of a university should be in engaging in this conversation. Can I uh, begin by avoiding answering your question completely? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, and I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm planning to go a little bit dark. Is that OK? Of and course. So, so bear with me here. Uh, and th this is the point when I speak, when my staff have fibrillations, where they're wondering what on earth is he going to say. But <laughs> I'm in true. Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I want to exercise my, my right to freedom of expression and freedom of speech. <laughs> so I'm going to do it. So coming over, I asked my very distinguished staff, you know, what is our position on the idea of a, a, a Geneva Convention equivalent? Mm -hmm on this issue, and they said, well, we need to think about it further. But listening to Brad, I think the case really is there for our articulation of it. Uh, because there's something deeper that worries me greatly, and that is the, somehow the assumption, is, the assumption that if we leave it as it is at the moment, you might reach the stage where the entire internet is in jeopardy, where it just collapses on the back of this sort of thing. And for those who will say it'll never happen, you only have to cast your mind back to 1913, uh, where there was a lecture given by this British publicist, Norman Angel, on the, on the basis of a book he wrote in, in 1911 called The Great Illusion. Basically what Angel had argued is that uh, trade and globalization and the industrial aid was of such a, had such a powerful effect on nations that it would be inconceivable that you could have a general European war. Inconceivable. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the basis of that, the then president of uh, Harvard, a man by the name of David Starr Jordan, uh, said these immortal words. He said, the great war in Europe, that eternal threat, will never come. The bankers won't come up with the money needed for uh, such a war, and industry won't support it, so statesmen simply won't be able to do it. There will be no great war. And this was in June of 1913. We are entirely capable of breaking this world, entirely capable of it. And if we do not take the requisite steps to prevent governments from engaging in folly and utter stupidity, madness, you know, it will happen, it can happen. Sorry, unless we take you know, decisive measures on, on this. Um, going to your point, I think when we look at uh, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, we need to maintain high thresholds. We need to maintain maximum latitude where these are concerned. But there is a, a, a break, of course, at least in international human rights law, when it comes to a, a crossover into incitement to hatred and under the First Amendment here in the US to violence. And making those decisions on when you've crossed requires a great feel for the law, the context, and, and the consequences. One of the issues we don't discuss more of, and I think we do need to, is the issue of density. If you have an individual at the far end of the sort of the the logic spectrum, who's mouthing off all sorts of things. It's not a threat to society, even if they were extreme in their views. But if we see a movement of communities, a sort of density beginning to accumulate on the fringe of opinion, you know, things, of course, can become extremely dangerous at that point. And it's making those judgments where we really need as many of you who are well-versed in human rights law as well as having an understanding of where technology is going to help us and to, to help Brad and I uh, and sort of define those points such that we can still enjoy a maximum latitude where freedom of expression is concerned, which is after all the greatest check on tyranny uh, and at the same time protect vulnerable communities. Well, thank you for leading by example with freedom of expression. Um, I now am going to read a couple of cards that have come in from the audience. 
The first one is you mentioned the UN Global Compact earlier, which is a soft law instrument. Do you think there should be a legally binding mechanism to hold corporations accountable for human rights violations, and what would that look like? And I think that can really actually go to both of you, but Brad, if you'd like to start with that. Sure. Well, I always think a first principle uh, needs to be that no one is or should be above the law. No individual should be above the law, no government should be above the law, and no company should be above the law. So if we're dealing with an issue as important as human rights, then I would be the first to say we better have good law to protect it. Uh, and uh, I therefore then think the next question becomes the harder one, which is the last part of that question. Great, what is it? What should it look like? Uh, and it, it, in my experience, I've had the opportunity to learn a few things you know, over time. Uh, first, you can't have law until you have a broad acceptance of a set of principles or norms, as some people like to say. You, you have to know what to write in, into the law. Um, so you need to start with a softer approach, and that's why a soft instrument like the UN Global Compact is not at all a bad thing. It gives people an opportunity to learn, to experiment, to build consensus across borders o over time. Uh, as principles emerge, uh, then they can move from a softer discipline into a harder one, namely enactment in, in law. Uh, I don't think there are many examples where somebody's been able to take a set of principles and go simply from you know, a voluntary agreement to a global mm -hmm. set of rules. Uh, that tends to be a leap too, too far. Uh, so you then have to start to build a set of laws that embody these principles. Uh, it's why in the United States you often find things at the state level before they go to Washington, D.C. Uh, it's why before they ever go to Geneva or New York, they're often in Brussels mm -hmm. with the European Union. Uh, so I think there is plenty of room uh, for stronger legal protection for human rights, including rules that apply to companies. And I would say we're seeing that today in a number of different circumstances. One of my favorites of 2016 and 2017 is in the area of accessibility. You know, as technology companies, we will either make the lives of the 1.2 billion people in the world that suffer from some kind of disability better or worse. And our customers will as well. Uh, because they'll either use technology that enables people with disabilities uh, to act or they won't. Uh, and so I think that it's actually a very constructive, productive step you know, that we saw the FCC in the United States enact rules that applied to telecommunication services and devices. I think it's a very constructive, protect, uh, productive movement that we just saw, say, the European Parliament act a week ago with a new uh, accessibility law uh, for Europe. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm not one to say that there will be one all-encompassing global charter this decade that will cover every aspect of, uh, of human rights. But I do think that the march forward needs to continue, and it probably best continues by taking subsets of the issues, uh, by adopting them in more and more countries, and then taking them to the United Nations or other international venues where they can become global in scope because I do think that that will need to become the ultimate destination. Great. Would you like to add to that? Um, our position on this is that we do have the guiding principles on uh, business and human rights that were elaborated on uh, by Professor John Ruggie at, at Harvard and embraced now by an increasing number of, of major companies, including mm -hmm. Microsoft. And uh, we don't want to see in any exercise uh, devoted to the writing up of an instrument, uh, not that we're against that, but we don't want to see the guiding principles weakened in such an exercise. So our position is, you know, the guiding principles need to be embraced by a larger, still larger number of of companies around the world. And in the meantime, as Brad was saying, if there's a discussion and it matures to the point where an instrument is needed, you know, so be it, so long as it keeps strengthening uh, the, uh, the work that we're trying to do together. And, um, and there is an initiative led by uh, Ecuador to move in that direction. Our position basically has been one where we're 
generally silent on it because we, uh, we have no objections so long as the guiding principles are not weakened. And we, at, we want to continue to encourage more com uh, companies to sign up, for them, sign up to them. Thank <laughs> you. So we were talking before this conversation in the green room a little bit about a next generation coming up and the incredible talents and potential strength of that generation to really make a positive contribution to the human rights space. This next question asks, what do you think the role of business schools and universities more generally um, should be in terms of furthering both freedom of expression and human rights more broadly? And again, I think this is really directed towards both of you, if either of you would like to start. Do you want to take this one first? All right. But it, it goes to the heart of, if I can go further back, I mean, mm -hmm. yes, it's very important. I mean, we have centers for human rights, usually connected to law schools and some medical schools as well. Uh, but to have them like it is here, connected to a business school is, is fundamentally important. But also there's something else. I, I mean, years ago, when I spent a great deal of time uh, studying the Holocaust, and I went to uh, Auschwitz and spent a couple of days there, and I read everything I could get my hands on, it was remarkable to me to understand how it was that in advance in 1942, eight out of the 15 people around the table had PhDs. Uh, the first commandant of Treblinka had two advanced degrees. In Birkenau, a number of the most horrific uh, abuses were committed by people with advanced degrees. In other words, there's no correlation. And in that famous speech by Charlie Chaplin in The Great Dictator at the end, when he said, you know, we don't need more clever people. We need kinder, compassionate people. And if they so happen to be clever, so be it. And it's not just learning you know, the law where human rights are concerned, but living it and breathing it and, and, and being a, a, a fulfilled human being because you're leading a meaningful life in the service of the rights of others. I mean, the most amazing thing to me in my position is when I hear senior officials who take a dismissive view of rights until something happens to them. And then they turn up and they, in whispered tones, tell me about how their families are under pressure back home, how they themselves receive threats. And now suddenly they are human rights defenders. Well, couldn't they have felt it before? When maybe it wasn't so personal, but they needed to empathize with others? And I think that's what we need ultimately to produce. And leaders in the corporate world who are empathetic, who are deeply compassionate, and I trust me, at the, you know, as you work through your career, you can feel very proud of what it is that you do if you're that sort of person. And I believe people who graduate from the school are those sorts of people. Thank you. Well, I can't imagine a better way to end than with a call for a more empathic world. Mm -hmm. So with that and the fact that we've come to the close of our time, I, before we thank our guests, I just want to thank, um, first of all, all of you in the audience. I want to thank Haas the Center for Responsible Business, and the Human Rights Center for convening this conversation. Um, there are boxed lunches for all of you on the way out, so please feel free to pick one up. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank both of you so much for your comments today and for your leadership in this space. Please join me in thanking our speakers.